Hello, Catechism students. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed your three or four week or whatever it was vacation from Catechism. Uh, it's going to take some adjusting to get used to as far as teaching in this manner um, and also learning in this manner. Uh, so just uh, bear with Pastor Daly and myself as well as um, uh, with you uh, in this new way of learning and teaching as we uh, seek to care for each other uh, by what we're doing and also listen to the uh, representatives that God has placed over us. And it just so happens that in lesson chapter, uh, lesson 22, uh, starting on page 115 in your catechism workbooks, we're talking about those very two commandments, the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment. Uh, there's a post in the Google Classroom for catechism uh, that was dated on Monday, April 13th, uh, from myself, uh, displaying uh, how the next two weeks uh, will go this week and next week, which I will be teaching you for, uh, and then Pastor Daly will take over uh, till the end of the year. But I want you to open up your workbooks to Lesson 22, starting on pages 115 in your workbook. And we're taking a look at honoring our neighbors. How do we treat other people as God desires? If you look, you have the fourth commandment and the fifth commandment written out for you there. Honor your father and mother that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not dishonor uh, or anger our parents and others in authority, but honor, serve, and obey them and give them love and respect. And the fifth commandment, you shall not murder. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not hurt or harm our neighbor in his body, but help and befriend him in every bodily need. Those are two commandments that have been on the forefront of my mind and and I'm sure on Pastor Daly's mind as well uh, during this time. As once again, as I highlight that we seek to follow the government's orders and also we're caring and cons uh, concerned about others and their health during this time. Both uh, fourth and fifth commandment issues there. But we're going to start by digging into the fourth commandment. Have you ever complained about what your parents said to you, a rule that they made for you uh, that you didn't agree with, kind of rolled your eyes? Uh, have you ever complained when they have told you to do some chores or, or go uh, clean your room or, or something like that? I I'm guessing you have. we sometimes complain and, and I do too. I sometimes complain um, when people that have been placed in authority over me make decisions that affect me. I don't always agree with them. I complain about them. We need to take a look at what God wants us to do as he uh, lays it out for us in the fourth commandment when it deals with those that God has uh, placed over us in authority. To help us with that, we're going to take a look at 2 Kings chapter 2, reading verses 23 and 24. The prophet Elisha and the disrespectful children. And when we look at number one, it says, How do the children show lack of respect for Elisha? Looking especially at uh, verse 23. You have the uh, verses there on your screen. You can read them with me. He went up from there to Bethel while he was going up on the road. Young boys came out from the city and mocked him. They said, go up, Baldy. Go up, Baldy. So he turned around and looked at them and cursed them in the name of the Lord. Then two female bears came out of the woods and they tore 42 boys 
pieces. Kind of a gory story in scripture, huh? An interesting story in scripture too. So how do the children show a lack of respect for Elisha? If you look at verse 23, I think it's fairly obvious, right? They make fun of him for being bald. That, that phrase, go up, baldy, go up, baldy. It's purely mocking Elisha for his looks. If I, never, if I ever give you, don't give you enough time, obviously just hit pause on the video to write down the answers. Number two, why do you think that what they said to Elisha is repeated twice in that verse? You know, they, they probably were chanting that name because of mockery, right? You think of when you make fun of someone or when you have made fun of someone, you tend to do that, right? You tend to go, hey, so-and-so, ba 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 and you keep on doing that, right? And you say whatever you want to say to try to get at them and try to hurt them. And you, you, you try to repeat it so that it really sticks at them. That's what they were doing here. Number three, why do you think they said these things? Well, I think they were obviously trying to be mean and, and make fun of Elisha, right? I, I think that's fairly obvious that that's exactly what's happening here. It's like when you go to someone and say, well, you're so short or, or whatever you want to say to make fun of them and, and try to hurt their feelings. That's exactly what uh, they were trying to do to Elisha. Number four says, Elisha was one of God's prophets. What was a prophet's job? If you think way back to lesson eight, a lot of people think that prophet is someone that foretells the future, and foretells the future correctly, right? Or almost like a, a, what we might consider a psychic in, in, in these days. But that's not at all what scripture is talking about when he's talking about prophet. Scripture, if you remember... Uh, where prophets were to go and tell people God's word. Anybody who speaks God's word in its truth and purity is a prophet. You could say that you are a prophet of God if you're talking to someone about God's word. I can say that I'm a prophet of God as I teach and preach God's word. Number five. How should the children have treated Elisha, whether he was a prophet or not? Another way to ask this question is, how would you treat other people? I think if you push our sinful nature out of the way, you know the answer, right? They should have been respectful to him. They should have treated him with love and honor and respect and care and concern. Not saying, Go up, Baldy. Go up, Baldy. But having that honor and respect for him. Uh, number six, it asks us to read those three uh, different passages or sections. In what areas of our lives has God placed people in authority over us? So 1 Peter 2 says, Submit to every human authority because of the Lord, whether to the king as the supreme authority, or to governors as those who have been sent by him to punish those who do what is wrong and to praise those who do what is right. If you look at that uh, passage from 1 Peter, what do you think that passage instructs us as far as who God has placed over us in our lives. Let's look at Hebrews 13, 7 and verse 17 uh, for the next one. Remember your leaders who spoke the word of God to you. Carefully consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith and also obey your leaders and submit to them. 
for they are keeping watch over your souls, those men who will give an account. Obey them so that they may do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no benefit to you. What do you think is the uh, people that God has placed over us according to Hebrews chapter 13? And finally, Ephesians 6. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. What is that saying? You know, I, I think that is really saying to us that, I think you can tell what that's saying to us, right? Perhaps this is the most obvious one because of uh, what the commandment, the fourth commandment actually says. So if you look at those three, you see that government, the church, and home are the places where God uh, has placed people in authority over us. Number seven, God's representatives in the government, the church, and our home are to look out for our well-being and take care of us. God has given each of these entities special authority over different parts of our lives. Is each one primarily concerned with our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being, or both? Well, when you think of the government, what does the government do? They have rules or laws in place over us to protect us, right? And to protect us, and, and, and they per, perhaps provide for us in certain ways, right? Help out um, at, at times or, or help out with those that, that do need help that aren't as blessed or as fortunate as others. When you think about those things that the government provides and protects for, what is it really doing? It's it's providing and protecting for our physical well-being. When you think of the church, is the church primarily concerned with the spiritual well-being or the physical well-being? Obviously, the church would be, in an essence, considered uh, um, concerned about both. But the primary concern of the church would be spiritual. Would be your eternal salvation. What about mom and dad? What about your parents or your guardians? What are they primarily concerned about? Your physical well-being? your spiritual well-being, or your both. Well, they provide shoes and clothing and food and a roof over your head, right? So physical, but also you're listening to me on a video. You're learning about God and his word. So obviously your parents are somewhat uh, concerned about your spiritual welfare as well. And so it would be both. Number eight, what should our attitude be uh, towards those in authority over us? I think that's very obvious, that we want to love and respect them. We want to love and respect all that they do. Number nine, how might it be possible to do what one of God's representatives wants me to do and still break the fourth commandment? So I do what the government wants me to do or do what my parents want me to do, and yet I don't actually keep the fourth commandment. How is that even possible? Well, if we do what is asked, but we do so without love, and respect. So I do it, but I do it kind of 
grudgingly. In other words, I, I roll my eyes. I'm disrespectful. I slam doors, whatever. Number 10, Hebrews 12, verses 9 through 11. We'll look at that. And also we'll look at what, when I don't do what I should, how should God's representative in the government or church or home respond? Hebrews 12 says, In addition, we have earthly fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them. Should we not submit even more to the Father of the spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while, according to what seemed best to them. But God disciplines us for our good, so that we may have a share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant when it is happening, but painful. Yet later it yields a peaceful harvest of righteousness for those who have been trained by it. When we think of discipline, right, we think of something bad. We think of being grounded. We think of privileges being taken away. We think of electronics being taken away or a phone being taken away or, or whatever the case is. Discipline often has a negative meaning in our uh, country, in our society. But discipline, scripturally speaking, um, is correcting my behavior through that discipline. We should expect the government, the church, and our homes to correct our behavior by discipline. Now, what does discipline mean? And that's, that's the interesting question, right? Because as I mentioned before, discipline has that negative meaning in our lives. So if you look at that purple box about halfway down on page 116 in your workbook, discipline really, is, scripturally speaking, is in love teaching people so they learn to do and say what is right. It's not done out of anger or trying to get revenge at someone for doing something. But instead, it's really done in love for that person. Number 11, how might our leaders in the government, church, or home discipline us? Think about how the government might discipline us. Well, part of the government would be like uh, a courtroom, right? and police officers. So part of the way that they can uh, discipline us is uh, writing tickets and possibly uh, demanding jail time and so on. What about the church? We don't often think about discipline in the church, right? So how can the church discipline? Well, in love, we can teach, right? We can teach others what is right and wrong. And also, if you remember way back uh, in the lessons we talked about confession, we carry out church discipline for those who are impenitent, right? Those who do not want God's forgiveness, who want to continue to live in their sin. We, there was those steps in Matthew chapter 18 of church discipline what is called, uh, in the end, excommunication. But it's all done in love. Your home. Grounding, enforcing timeouts, taking away privileges, gently using physical correction, and so on. These are all ways that discipline uh, can be present in our lives from the government, from church, and from our home. Number 12, what are ways that we can show love and respect to our leaders in the government, church, and home? So how can we respect those that God has placed over us? Government, follow the rules. Be respectful. Don't push the limit. Don't push the laws. But follow the rules that your government has laid out for you. Church, listen to the leaders. Listen to your pastors. Listen to your teachers. Worship God. 
check what is taught with God's word. So when your teachers, teachers are teaching you something about God's word or, or when your pastors, Pastor Daly or I, are, are teaching you something about God's word, check God's word. Is what we are teaching and preaching, does it agree with what God's word says? And home, be kind to your parents. Listen to them. Obey them without complaining. Looking at number 13 on the top of page 117, it asks us to read uh, Acts 5, verses 27 through 29. What is one time when we ought not to listen to or obey the leaders that God has placed over us? The one time that we're not to obey the leaders that God has placed over to us is right here in Acts 5. After they brought them in, they asked them, uh, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin. Sanhedrin, if you remember, is, is kind of a religious ruling body. The high priest asked them, did we not give you strict orders not to teach in his name? Look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching. And you are determined to bring this man's blood down on us. But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. What is one time when we ought to disobey the leaders that God has placed over us? When they tell us to sin against God. If the government tells, comes and tells you, you need to kill your unborn child because there are too many people in this country, that is a time that you go against what the government or someone in authority says. Why? Because in that case, the government is telling you to do something that God has told you not to do. Do not kill people. Your parents tell you to lie. That is one time, uh, a, an example where you don't listen to your parents because they are telling you to go against what God says. So only when they tell us to sin against God. How does the fourth commandment serve as a mirror uh, for us, that second use of the law, or another way to ask that question is what sin does it show us? Shows us how we've disobeyed and disrespected our uh, representatives God has placed over us. You look at this commandment, you look at the what does this mean? It's clear. We break this commandment almost every single day. 15. How did Jesus keep the fourth commandment in our place through his active obedience? It asks us to read Luke 2, verses 51 and 52. Those words read, He went down with them and came to Nazareth. He was always obedient to them, and his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and with people. We don't know a lot about Jesus and, and his childhood, but what we do know is this. We do know that from these few verses that Jesus was always obedient. He loved his parents. And he always did what they said. So he's perfectly obedient to his parents. He was perfectly obedient to the government. And he was perfectly obedient to church leaders. Number 16, how did Jesus solve our continued breaking of the fourth commandment? through his passive obedience on our behalf. If you look at that, I think it's fairly obvious, right? What did he do? He died and forgave us for all the times we have not treated his representatives as we should. Just one more of those sins uh, that put Jesus on the cross. Number 17, how does the fourth commandment serve as a guide? 
third use of the law for us. Well, we want to thank God for forgiving our sins by obeying his representatives joyfully. Remember, this question is always asking us, what does God want us to do? He wants us to obey those that he has uh, placed over us. He wants us to thank God uh, for forgiving our sins and to obey the government, church leaders, and uh, our home life, the parents that he's placed over us joyfully. Not because we have to, but because we want to. If you look at that chart on the bottom of page 117 in your workbook, God blesses us by church, by our homes, by the government, which are called his representatives in that green shaded area. Now he wants us to honor those people. He wants us to serve and obey them in love and respect always, even when we disagree with them. What he doesn't want us to do is disobey and dishonor and anger them. We're going to jump into the fifth commandment now, and that is uh, Luke 10, verses 25 through 37 is, is the scriptural account that we're going to uh, take a look at. A familiar parable, if you uh, have been in St. Paul's Lutheran School uh, for any amount of time, or Trinity Lutheran School, you've went through this parable at least a handful of times. But before we jump into that, I want to ask you this question. Do you know what cryonics is? Cryonics spelled C-R-Y-O-N-I-C-S. Cryonics. Let me explain it to you. It's where when someone dies, they want their body to be frozen, kind of in a huge metal tube refrigerator type thing. Uh, if, if you Google an image of cryotonics, you'll, you'll see something like that. Um, at least the tube where the person is, is placed. But my question to you is, why would anyone want that to happen? Why would you freeze your body? Well, uh, you know, I think it's, for a lot of people, it's because they're waiting or, or thinking that medical technology or advancements are going to happen to the point where whatever they died from could be cured and hopefully they can be brought back to life and can continue to live on this earth. But there's a big problem with that, right? Because we're never going to escape death. You know, I, I think um, it has something to do with the fifth commandment, too. Because they are trying to preserve themselves and, and trying to preserve some sort of health that, that is not going to be there. Now, we should be caring, caring about the health and concern of others but not in that way. Ways that God wants us to be uh, concerned about our, our health. So let's take a look and, um, and read uh, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. Just then an expert in the law stood up to them saying, Teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law, he asked him. What do you read there? He replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. He said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jericho, Jerusalem to Jericho. He fell among robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. It just so happened that a priest was going down that way. 
But when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite also happened to go there. But when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. A Samaritan, as he traveled, came to where the man was. When he saw them, he felt sorry for the man. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, wrapping them and putting wine on them. He put him on his own animal, took him to an inn and took care of him. The next day when he left, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. Whatever extra you spend, I will repay you when I return. Which of these three men do you think acted like a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The one who showed mercy to him, he replied. Then Jesus told him, go and do likewise. So there we see a, a man uh, believed that he could get to heaven by what he was doing and the good that he was doing. And he asked Jesus these questions to try to affirm that belief that what he was doing was good enough. The parable that Jesus told uh, was a parable designed to say what you're doing is not good enough and it will never be good enough. Uh, Jesus also in this parable teaches us what our neighbor is and who our neighbor is. So looking at number 18, in Jesus' parable, how did the robbers hurt the man? In other words, what outward thing did an obvious thing did those robbers do? Obviously, they beat him, took his possessions. Those are blatant outward sins, sins that you and I can see. Number 19, how did the priest in verse 31 and the Levite in verse 32, as you have them uh, there on your screen, hurt the man? These were sins of omission. They weren't sins that were blatant and obvious, but things that they should have been doing that they didn't do. And what should have they been doing? They should have been helping that man, right? And what did they do? They passed by on the other side. Neither helped the man. Number 20. What about our lives are so important that God protects them with the fifth commandment? So what about our lives? Because when you watch the news uh, in certain parts, in certain areas, it doesn't seem like life is very important. So what about our lives is so important that God takes a whole commandment to protect our lives? Our lives are, are our time to learn about God's forgiveness in Jesus. From the time that we're born to the time that we die, that is our time to learn about Jesus and to come to faith in him. And that brings us to our next key term, about a third of the way down on the page, almost half the way down uh, on 118 in that purple box, time of grace. You'll hear that uh, phrase being used every once in a while. Uh, time of grace simply means this, the time during our lives when we have the chance to come to faith in our Savior. So once again, that, that's the time from when we're born to when we die. That period is called our time of grace, the time that Jesus has given you and me and everyone else to come to faith in their Savior. You know, you kind of, kind of think it's like a person who wants a job and they have to take a test. And if they pass the test, they get it. They get the job. If they, if they fail the test, uh, they don't get the job. Our lives are like that in, in a way, except the result has eternal consequences. Number 21, do we have the right to take any lives? I think a very obvious answer uh, to this by the commandment itself is no, we should not kill anyone. I think that's a fairly obvious answer, but we need to dig a little bit deeper into the fifth commandment. Because if we just read it off the top like that, it it's kind of says, well, I haven't killed anybody, so I must be doing pretty good. But before we get into that, we need to answer a few more questions here. Who has the right to take human life? Read Romans 
13, verses 3 through 5, which says, For rulers are not a terror to do to good conduct. To, for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to evil. Would you like to have no fear of the one in authority? Do what is good, and you will receive praise from him, because he is God's servant for you and for your benefit. But if you do wrong, be afraid, because he does not carry the sword without reason. He is God's servant, a punisher to bring wrath on the wrongdoer. Therefore, it is necessary to submit not only because of wrath, but also because of conscience. You know, the, I, the, the key phrase there is carry the sword. Who has the right to take human life? Only God. But he's given that authority to the government to punish wrongdoing. Which brings us to our next term, key term, capital punishment. And that's when the government punishes wrongdoing by taking someone's life. There are different methods of um, capital punishment. There's the electric chair. You've probably heard of that. There's lethal injection where they basically inject a person with poison. Um, or a, a medicine to stop their heart. Um, and so the government punishes wrongdoing by taking someone's life. God has given them that power of the sword. Now, when you think about that, right, um, some states like Michigan don't have capital punishment, but other states do, and our federal government does as well, the United States government. So if you have a federal crime or in one of the states that have capital punishment, you do a crime where they say that it's punishable by death if you're convicted uh, guilty of the crime, then you have the uh, chance to be put to death in that manner. When you think about it, um, the Christian's response to this is, Whatever the government decides in reasonable uh, ways is a fit punishment for the crime. Generally, um, that is okay. That is to be followed because God gives the government the power of the sword. Number 23 gets into uh, kind of three big definitions here. What are some ways that we can hurt ourselves or others? and break this commandment. The first key term, suicide. Killing yourself or self-murder. You know, uh, that's the idea when things get so bad in our lives, we don't feel like continuing, and we feel like the only option is to, to take our lives, but God strictly forbids that in this commandment. Because doing that would be killing ourselves, would be murdering ourselves. Euthanasia, or, or mercy killing as it's sometimes called. Definition is murdering someone to end their suffering. Uh, someone asks you to, to kill them, to put them out of their misery. Maybe it's a, a a friend or a loved one that is going through some terminal illness. And it'd be easier for them if, if they just died, right? They wouldn't have to go through all that pain and suffering. That's not what God wants us to do. That's committing murder or helping someone commit murder to end their suffering. We want to allow God to take us on his own time. You know, there was a doctor in Michigan a while ago named Dr. Kevorkian, sometimes called Dr. Death. And he would do this. He would help people essentially kill themselves. He would, he would facilitate that mercy killing. Um, 
but he shouldn't have been doing that. And those people shouldn't have been asking for that because it goes against what God's word says. Abortion. Murdering an unborn child. We're children, we're human beings before uh, when we're in the womb of our mothers. Scripture is very clear on that. In the psalm it says, I was sinful from birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. And abortion would be going against the fifth commandment. We would be murdering that unborn child if we made that decision. Number 24, we can break the fifth commandment without ever taking someone's life or hurting someone as the robbers did or ignoring someone in great bodily need as the priest and the Levite did in the uh, parable of the Good Samaritan. Read Matthew chapter 5, verses 21 and 22. And we want to see here how Jesus, how does Jesus say we can break this commandment without ever actually physically hurting someone? So the idea there is, right, um, I haven't ever murdered someone or I haven't murdered myself or anyone else, so I must be doing pretty good with this commandment. But then we take a look at what Scripture says. You have heard that it was said to people long ago, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that everyone who is angry with his brother without a cause will be subject to judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, will have to answer the Sanhedrin. But whoever says, you fool, will be in danger of hellfire. So it's not only saying, if you murder someone, you're breaking this commandment. But really what it's saying is, if you're hating someone or saying mean things to them, you're also breaking this commandment. That's what those last two, two uh, that last verse, those last two sentences or three sentences are saying. In the sense that if you are harboring hate or harboring jealousy or holding a grudge, trying to get revenge on someone, if you're hating someone or, or saying mean things about them, those go against the fifth commandment because you're not caring for a person's body. Number 25, if we hold a grudge against someone, why would we be guilty of breaking the fifth commandment? Well, if you're thinking of, of a grudge, if you know what a grudge is, a, a grudge is um, holding anger against someone, trying to get uh, revenge against someone perhaps. Uh, it, it can be even the fact that that person's come to you and asked for forgiveness and you have said you forgive them, but you're holding this kind of in the back of your mind and you bring it up over and over and over again when that person does something wrong. You haven't really forgiven them, but you're harboring, harboring that, uh, that hate, essentially, in your heart for them. Well, we are harboring anger in our hearts towards someone if we are holding a grudge, and therefore we are breaking the fifth commandment. Number 26 asks us to read Matthew chapter 18, verse 15. And there, instead of getting angry with someone who wrongs us in some way, it asks us, what should we do? Well, if you read that verse, it says, if your brother sins against you, go and show him his sin just between the two of you. If he listens to you, you have regained your brother. So what are you to do? We should, take, we should talk to the person about the sin, and forgive one another. If someone hurts you on the playground or at recess, do you go and you tell the teacher right away? Say, so-and-so did this to me. No, really what you are to do first, as long as someone's not bleeding or... Um, significantly physically hurt if it's something like my feelings were hurt i should go talk to that person that said those things about me and see if we can resolve the issue hopefully 
me talking with that person or you talking with the person that hurts you will be able to resolve that conflict. Uh, number 27, Jesus' parable was not only intended to show how we should treat one another, it should be obvious that we should not hurt others or that we should help someone who needs help. The point of Jesus' parable was to answer the man's question about whom he should consider his neighbor in verse 29. Jesus made the good guy of the parable a Samaritan. The Samaritans lived in, to the north of Judea and were people with whom Jewish people did not get along at all. Jesus' answer to the man's question was, really, everyone on earth is your neighbor. We're going to take a look at Matthew chapter uh, 5, verses 43 through 48. How does Jesus say we should treat all people, even though, even those with whom we don't get along? That reads, you have heard it say, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you your enemies, but I tell you love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be children of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Indeed, if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Even tax collectors do that, don't they? If you greet only your brothers, what are you doing more than others? Do not even the unbelievers do that? So then be perfect, as your heavenly Father is perfect. So God really pours out his blessings on people, no matter who they are, right? Take the example of, of uh, two farmers. Uh, one on one side of the street, his field is the believer's field. On the other side of the street, that, that piece of land is owned by an unbeliever. So does God allow it to rain on one side of the street in the believer's field and not on the unbeliever's field, cause, causing the unbeliever's uh, crops to scorch and wither in the summer heat? No, of course not. That's not how God works. So what is God trying to tell us here? He's saying, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. This is a lot easier said than done, but it's exactly what God wants us to do. To love our enemies, to have care and concern for their welfare and for their souls. Pray for those who persecute you. Because even if they're your enemy, even if they persecute you, there's still a soul that needs to be saved. We don't want to wish hell on anyone, not even our enemies. And so every person that we meet, that's a soul that needs salvation. I think it's a lot easier, or at least a little bit easier, to think about loving your enemies and caring and concerning uh, yourself uh, for them if you consider that that's a soul that needs to be saved by Jesus. Number 28, the man correctly summarized the second of the two tables of the law that we should love our neighbors as we love ourselves. What does this parable teach us that will apply to our study of the fourth through tenth commandments. So if you remember, commandments one, two, and three really deal with our relationship with God, right? You shall have no other gods. Uh, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Those really deal with our relationship between God and us, right? Now commandments four through ten really deal with our relationships Sorry. I apologize, something uh, popped up on my screen here and 
um, kicked me out of the presentation. Uh, so what I'm going to do is I am going to simply do the last couple of questions. Um, from this screen here. Uh, number 28 is that we are to love everyone on earth. Those That's dealing with our relationship with each other. Uh, number 41, or, or sorry, number 29, how does the fifth commandment serve as a mirror or second use of the law? In other words, what sins does it show us? And as you see on the screen there, it shows us that we've, uh, hurt our neighbors and neglected to help others as we should have. So we're not always kind. We're not always considerate. We hurt some people with our words and our actions. Number 30, how did Jesus keep the fifth commandment in our place through his active obedience? Well, Jesus always helped and loved other people. Even when he was on the cross, his enemies who had nailed him to the cross, who were at the feet of the cross mocking him, and who were casting lots for his clothing, what does he say to them? He says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He never had bad thoughts. He never said hateful words. He always helped others. Number 31, how did Jesus solve our continued breaking of the fifth commandment through his passive obedience on our behalf? In other words, what did he do to take away our sins? Well, Jesus died to forgive us for all the times we haven't treated our neighbors properly. And finally, how does the fifth commandment serve as a guide? In other words, what does it tell us that we should be doing? while well, we want to help others in all things and to thank God for rescuing us from our sin. And finally, the lesson question, how do I treat other people as God desires? I will respect and obey God's representatives in the government, home, and church, and help other people in every need. So God's gift of life, we really want to honor and love and respect it. We want to be a friend to others, defend others, encourage one another. We don't want to do anything that hurts the body, like murder, abortion, uh, seeking revenge, abusing our own bodies with alcohol and drugs and so on, committing suicide and the like. Your homework, uh, I will have a Google form sheet for you to fill out. Uh, you're going to have to watch this video in order to do it. Um, you'll be having this week lessons 22, I believe. Yep, this is lesson 22, lesson 22 and 23. Um, teach uh, via video. I should say taught via video. And then uh, you'll have a lesson 22 Google form sheet that you need to fill out. And also a uh, lesson 23 Google form sheet that you need to fill out when that video is up. And both of those Google form sheets will be due next Friday, uh, May, or sorry, April uh, 24th, that would be. Now, next week I'll be teaching you lessons uh, 24 four and 25. Uh, I will also have Google form sheets up for lessons 24 and 25 uh, next week when those videos go up. Um, those Google form sheets, worksheets will be due the following week, uh, the following Friday on May 1st. 
So at least for me, when I'm teaching you those, these four classes uh, before Pastor Daly takes over, what I am going to do is you're going to have those uh, Google Form worksheets that go with each lesson. And so for the two lessons this week, that's due the next Friday. So the one that I give you today will be due on Friday, April 24th along with the one that will be coming later this week. I certainly thank you for uh, listening today. If you have any questions, uh, by all means, contact me uh, in Google Classroom or in any way that you see fit. Uh, certainly wish you God's blessings. Uh, this is an adjustment I know for you and for me, and we will continue to give... Uh, uh, each other a little bit of leniency as, as we continue to work through the uh, kinks uh, and the difficulties in this. Why don't we close with prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, everything that you have given us. We ask you to give us wisdom to uh, do and follow what God's word says uh, regarding the fourth and fifth commandments. Uh, we ask that you continue to uh, help us to obey those commandments. We ask that you uh, help us during this time of self-isolation, uh, social distancing or physical distancing, um, to be patient with one another, encourage one another, and help one another. We ask most of all, and we thank you most of all, uh, that you, give, you have given us your one and only Son, Jesus, to take away our sins, to take away our sins of the fourth and fifth commandment, and every other commandment that you have given us. And we um, ask you to continue to bless us with the spiritual blessings that, uh, that you have given us throughout our lives and that you continue to give us. Uh, we ask also that you pray for the people that um, are putting themselves on the front lines every day, our, our health care workers, our police officers, our grocery store workers, and, and so on. Um, as this virus continues to spread, uh, they risk themselves getting caught so that they can provide for us for our health and uh, for, our, uh, for our physical health and for our um, physical welfare. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we ask that you provide for our spiritual welfare and keep us close during this time. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, thank you for listening to this video. God's blessings. Uh, and we'll see you in a day or two when I get the next video up. God's blessings. Have a great evening. Or a great day, I should say. Bye-bye.